Tonight in Q Weekly, we look back on the glamour of Eurovision 2004 with two very special guests. We look in on the recent address at Globe by gay activist icon Rodney Croom. Hello there, welcome once again to Q Weekly here on Ben TV. Nice to have your company. Now, what do you suppose I am doing wearing this tacky, tasteless sequin hat, eh? Well, those three words in themselves should give you a clue, because tacky, tasteless and sequins usually conjure up but one thing. That's right, you guessed it, Eurovision. The Eurovision season has been in full swing the last few weeks, culminating last night in the grand final. And we have two very special guests here with us today to... Uh, have a bit of a discussion about Eurovision 2004. They're the hosts of the closest thing we've had here in Australia to Eurovision, Eurobeat, the Eurovision musical, which premiered at this year's Melbourne Comedy Festival, Bronya and Sergei from uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. How are you going? Dobrovecha, very well. Very, very well, thank you. <laughs> very pleased to be here. It's a complete honour to have the nearest thing we have to Australia's first couple of Eurovision on the show. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. We're not actually a couple, though. I just oh. want to let you... We're not actually you know, sleeping together. We're just a professional working partnership. Of course. Of yes, course. old pros, yeah? yeah old pro for example, yes, old professionals. <laughs> <laughs> but look, it's fabulous to have you on. And look, what what is it about Eurovision? And this is so big, not only in Europe but here in Australia now. What is it about it that uh, has this influence? On I it? suppose it's just everyone having a good time and getting yes. out and everyone having fun and feeling good about themselves. I mean, it doesn't really matter if the quality of the acts aren't quite, you know, what you would expect, but it's about everyone having fun. Oh, I think the quality is exactly what we expect, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I think also it's one thing to see people get up there and really try. There's nothing like watching people trying. And, you know, you can have your Australian Idol and your pop stars because they don't take it seriously. And Eurovision, they take it so very, very seriously that we, we delight in watching what they do. And some of them are very trying, aren't they? Let's face it. <laughs> some of them are very <laughs> they're the, trying. They're even more enjoyable because you get to laugh at them, which yes. is wonderful. Laugh with, laugh with. Laugh, laugh, laugh with, to laugh of course. at is cruel Laugh and with, nasty. of course, oh, yes. thank you for clarifying that. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. So what does it take to be the perfect Eurovision host? And I, mean, I think you guys have got what it takes, but can oh, you define you. it? I suppose an open mind, I think. An open mind? An open mind. And a lot of love. A mm. lot of love for the subject, because I, th I think you will notice with us, Ellen, we don't make fun. No, we take very seriously as oh, well do. the culture behind it, uh, the country it's come from, and we like to keep every I personally, and I know you feel the of same. Course. Every country is separate; it has mm -hmm. its own special flavor. United Kingdom aside, it has got their own special. Well, the food is so bland. What can you do? But it's fantastic <laughs> in that way. So it's a lot of love for the people that you're watching and going. Come on, you can do it. Of course, yes. I mean, I think it was also a good working relationship. I mean, I feel we really have a chemistry oh. together, which really, oh. it really is really is brilliant. Like to present and to really uh, yes. bring the show together, right? Yes. We are sort of a referees of sorts. Yes. I come from a news reading background, very serious uh, woman. And uh, of course he has his own uh, breakfast show in the morning for children, Wake Up with Sergei. Mm. <laughs> and uh, and like, I, you know, so to bring us together was quite a, quite a challenge and quite a risk. And well, it paid off in dividends. A risk worth taking, I yes. can assure you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Thing. Were you pleased with the selection for your own country, Bosnia-Herzegovina? Most definitely. We are very proud of, of Dean. Your... Oh, Dean. yes, very proud Barely of Barely 22. Do you remember when you were 22 a year I'm ago? I'm not yet, actually. You're not yet? No. I thought he was 20. Two! Uh, no, older. He's had a hard life. <laughs> yes. Dean, of course, uh, was part of 7UP, uh, uh, oh. Bosnian boy band, very popular. He's yeah. won a million Grammys, well, equivalent. And, uh, what are they called? 
Uh, the gram is the brooches. Mm. The brooches. Yeah, not the brooches. The brooches. Do we get a little statue of you? Oh, uh, it is a they woman. Wish. <laughs> yeah, they do. Mm, they okay. wish. It is. A, it is a naked woman. It's true. Mm. I don't know if it's based on me. She's not as. But uh, it's. She's lovely. Yes. And so he was fantastic tonight. He was great. Um, she but. Made you proud. He did do us really proud. Did. Well, really I, did. Really did. I'm sorry, but he does sort of, his, his voice evokes in me uh, sort of a dirty phone caller, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry. Really? I'm sorry. Wash my mouth out. No, I oh. see where you're coming from. He's not really projecting. No. I mean, he's very quiet. Mm. And he's in the disco. He's lost his voice. It's too much. Well, too I, much thought, I thought that was what made him so popular in Bosnia, really. Uh, I mean, I thought, phone call uh, really, really. I think that's what made him appeal to the wider population of Bosnia as a government, Possibly, really. Yes. The wider population like that sort of thing, do they? Well, I suppose so. It's so cold and dark there and sometimes that the internet and the phone is the only kind of outside information <laughs> yes. you can get. Only sort of companionship you can get. You know, it's yes. It's Not you, of course. Of You're course flooded not. with offers. Flooded. <laughs> <laughs> After Eurobeat, it was crazy. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. He had men, women, dogs, cats knocking down his door. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Bronya. That's all right. Even oh. when there was no cat flap. But anyway, <laughs> uh, moving right along, who else? Who else did we like from this year? Here. My my personal favourite was Cyprus, Cyprus, uh, Cyprus as we like to say, because it was the naked voice, and much like Monaco, the girl singing. I like the women solo. I like to hear this piercing voice that comes through, and I think it's a beautiful sound because uh, you can't make mistakes if you stuff up, as they say in Australia. <laughs> if you stuff up, you're stuffed, and you don't win. What did you think of? Uh, oh, Greece? the shake it, uh, shake it, oh. shake it. It's catchy. When he opened his mouth, Sergei and I believed or thought we imagined that maybe it was there was a lot of um, a bit of help. Yes, a little bit of slightly help. enhanced, Might have, like electronic augmentation. Yes, Might did you know like do for um what's her name the little one that, that gives me the shits uh, Kali Minogue. Yes. Kali Minogue. I was going to say Danny, but well, no, same not thing, really. that. But it's the same thing. <laughs> There's clearly an augmentation in the voice to get them to sound a little bit more, and it didn't look like a I, he looked like a nice Greek he big did. boy, and he it was, was so high. Guy. It was very it high. It was quite high. I wanted something deeper. Mm. Oh. Yes. Shake it, shake it. Shake it, shake it. It was catchy, though. That's the thing. It was oh, pure, yes. pure Eurovision. Yes, pure yes. Eurovision. And good dancing, the two girls. Well, in the mm. preview video, they did mm. fantastic dancing, so... What a brilliant mm. sort of handwork they had. Yes, where they he did. ripped them off. I know. Get very... off me, he's saying. Don't <laughs> touch so me. Clever. I'm gay. Get away. I know. Yes, boys. <laughs> I think it's what he was saying. I think it that's was. what he was saying, in, yes. not, in not such a veiled way. I think it was. <laughs> I thought it was very symbolic. And somebody who doesn't have to use symbolism was Thomas Tordeson from uh, Denmark. Out and proud gay boy, married to his uh, his boyfriend. Yes. And well done to him. If you can't have that kind of diversity in Eurovision, when can you have it? Uh, do you have gay people in Bosnia Herzegovina? I think there's about a four, few, four or yes. five. Yes. Um, uh, yes, I do believe four or five of them. That, that they're all members of your fan club, aren't they? Yeah, well, they are. <laughs> oh, they, they love Bronya. How <laughs> did you guess? It's ah. terrifying. <laughs> no, but the ones that, one, that will actually come out and say, yes, because otherwise they might not keep their job. And we've got a long way to go there, mm. there's no doubt. We certainly do. We, no, there's no doubt. We're, we're not the most progressive of people. Like not, no, not no, not like no. those Danes and those Swedes mm. and those n Norwegians. Is that how you say that? <laughs> The Nordics. The Nordics. The Nordics. Yes. You know, I mean, the they're Vikings. so out there. They're the out there. They are know. out there. They, they love everything and everyone. <laughs> I've been some, to some magnificent parties there, but that's another story. Oh, God, we won't go into that. <laughs> I wasn't well, overly impressed with the old stalwarts of Eurovision this year, like the UK, France, Germany, Ireland. Um, some of them were hard to tell the difference between. That is the unfortunate thing, yes. I think. It, Europe, we, while it is good that Europe is unifying, yes. very much good. unifying, it, Say is, it. it is still, unfortunately, I hope we don't lose the diversity. That's uh, right. The diversity. Yes, it's all very and well to have the same money system, but mm. I liked it when there was Lira. 
and Franks mm. and Deutschmarks. Mm. No, but I think with the United Kingdom, it's so hit or miss, isn't it, mm. Ellen? I mean, we know that every year it's the same kind of quality we've it, come to expect is. from United Kingdom. Mm. Tragic. And every time I see them in rehearsal, you see them in rehearsal, mm. trying, getting people in, doing more dancing, mm. trying to learn how to kick. I mean, it's if it's not already now, it never will be. And then if you can't even start on the correct note, well, nul point. Well, last year they concentrated on the dancing at the expense of the... The right note, really, didn't they? <laughs> it, it is really, a, it is really a matter of trying to pull a a fitted sheet over a too big a mattress. I think <laughs> it is really just one of those things that you can't just you can't really get it all in once. Bronnie, I believe you've got a close friend called uh, Julia, who's actually got a, a show coming up, and she'd like to actually some tell people, you about she is I know. Lovely. Some people say she's an alter ego. An alter ego. Yes, but others would say it's just me. But I don't believe it. Yes, Julia's a mirror. She's so very busy. I don't think she's very talented, <laughs> but boy, is she busy. And she's doing a show called Spontaneous Broadway. Which is musical as well. Spontaneous Broadway. Spontaneous Broadway. At yeah? the Chapel of Chapel, down the road, so easy. First two weeks of June, come down and see us invent from scratch with no script a whole musical. Wow. I know, it's very exciting. So if you like music, mm. you know, Eurovision is all about music, we actually get suggestions from the audience and we sing songs completely from scratch based on those titles. And I then the audience know. chooses which musical they like and we do the whole thing in the second half. We will have to go together, Bronya. And watch yes, Julia and watch and Julia everyone. perform that because she's be so busy. Wow. That would be wonderful. Yes. Bronya Sergei, thank you so much well, thank thank you for you. joining us in this Eurovision 2004 oh. review. Oh, it's another 12 months. Well, next one, what am I going to do? Oh, I don't know what's going to Buy the CD and listen to it. Yeah. It's fantastic. You can, you, you can better you can get the music of every, and the Eurovision over the exactly. years. Oh, you can. And if not, you can get the CD for Eurobeat, the Eurovision musical, fresh from this year's Melbourne Comedy Festival. Yes, and wouldn't that be exciting? Look at this. Oh, you're out of the shop. Well, there you <laughs> if we, there I'll we get out. There you put it in. No, no, that's it. <laughs> it Wonderful. Thanks Wonderful. so much, guys. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, you, Alan. Thank you. And see you right after the break in Q Weekly. Thank you, thank you, Peter, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for inviting me to speak here tonight. Tomorrow, May the 1st, May Day, is a day that we remember freedom struggles, particularly the struggle of workers around the world, um, and also being a day to celebrate new life and the beginning of spring in the Northern Hemisphere. It's a day that we in Tasmania uh, remember as the day in 1997 when our upper house, the Legislative Council, that sits in a room much like this one, finally, after 15 years of resistance, uh, agreed without any qualifications or caveats to the decriminalisation of homosexuality. In Parliament, of course, there was overwhelming opposition, particularly in the upper house, to any change parliamentarians calling for the reintroduction of the death penalty for homosexuality. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> um, symbolically throwing legislation in the, rub in the rubbish bin where they believed it belonged. Six times our upper house rejected decriminalisation of homosexuality. Angrily, bitterly, with some awful vitriol before finally it was convinced to change. So for my colleagues and I, first means one simple thing that when a small number of people acting with courage, intelligence and faith in their compatriots sets itself a task of achieving justice, anything is possible. LGBTI Australians are under a concerted attack today, an attack I think more dangerous and more, more organised than we've seen for over a generation. Once a fringe hate group that everyone laughed at, Salt Shakers, is now claiming to have convinced major companies to withdraw their advertisements from the L word. 
you would have seen coverage about that issue. And not just conservative companies, but companies that market themselves as hip and groovy, like Just Chains. The Australian Family Association, also once a non-player in Australian politics, is now having its, heard voice, its voice heard sorry, on every major social issue. It's in the newspaper all the time. And according to recent reports, it's even making submissions directly to federal cabinet. Salt shakers and the Australian Family Federation are no longer bleating disorganised groups they once were. You just have to take one look at their websites and you'll see professional, upmarket organisations in the mould of their American equivalents. None of Australia's LGBT rights organisations can match the resources of those anti gay groups can. But the th threat to our rights and dignity from the far right is nothing compared to that from the federal government. Earlier this week, as you'd all be aware, John Howard announced that he will remove all uncertainty about the legal definition of marriage by ensuring that the Marriage Act and the Family Law Act clearly define matrimony as the union of a man and a woman. He'll be cutting off the only judicial path our community has to marriage reform. Unlike Canada, Australia doesn't have a constitutional guarantee of rights and freedoms. The kind of guarantee which in Canada led to gay marriage. If John Howard succeeds, we'll have a much, much more difficult path to hoe to achieve gay marriage. The government will have effectively cemented into law the second-rate legal status of same-sex relationships. Now, I have to say at this point that I'm very happy that Mark Latham has repeatedly committed his party to removing discrimination against same-sex couples in important areas <coughs> like superannuation. by eloquently speaking out in support of same-sex couples, adopting children, and about LGBT people joining, to quote him, a widening circle of mateship, Latham has become, in my view, Labor's best leader on LGBT issues. But on an immensely important symbolic issue like marriage, Labor has decided to mimic the government. What I believe we should be calling for is for its left wing and also for Rainbow Labor, the LGBT group network within Labor, to speak out on this issue, to try and soften Labor's stance so that the Catholic Brotherhood in the ALP doesn't rule the roost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's what they're doing right now. I mean, what a contrast to British Labor or New Zealand Labor, who are championing comprehensive reform on same-sex couple rights, championing issues like civil unions, and don't forget Spain, one of the world's most Catholic countries, where the newly elected left of center government has promised equality in marriage for same-sex couples. It's a sad day indeed when a handful of well-placed conservative Catholics in Australia managed to do what the entire religious establishment of Spain can't, that is, stop gay marriage. Some advocates believe that we shouldn't be campaigning on marriage reform. They argue that it's not what the LGBT community wants, that it will stir up the far right, that it will jeopardise change on more important issues like superannuation, that debate is being driven by the Conservatives, that Australians don't really care about that kind of stuff, they don't care about moral issues, that it's just not the right time and that it's just not the right issue. I believe each of those objections is wrong. If the US marriage debate shows anything, it's that far from sidelining other reforms, marriage actually, actually mainstreams them. Suddenly, American Conservatives who once vehemently opposed civil unions, 
support them. Precisely because they're not marriage. Here, the increasingly conservative Australian newspaper, for decades completely silent about our rights, never endorsing our rights in any respect, has twice since the beginning of the year advocated for superannuation and property reform for same-sex couples as an alternative for mar to marriage. Senator Guy Barnett, who I mentioned earlier, one of the most conservative politicians I've ever met, and that's saying something, had a piece in the Launceston Examiner yesterday, and he said, I'm against marriage. Homosexuals should not be allowed to undermine it. But I've decided that I support their rights in superannuation. I support their rights to have property division. Even for those couples who have children already, I support their rights to look after those children. Now, that mightn't sound like much of a concession, but it's a big concession coming from him. And that's because we've started talking about marriage. And marriage makes everything else look much simpler than it did before. <laughs> <coughs> much more acceptable, much more mainstream. When Guy Barnett supports superannuation reform for same-sex couples, you know that issue is well and truly over. Two people becoming one is an inspiring and potentially radical idea. It challenges a society in which extreme individualism is the norm where the pursuit of one's own pleasure is promoted as the font of happiness, but where that dream can too often fail to fulfil. And many people feel as a result isolated and alienated from the world around them. The core aspiration of marriage is that we can transcend the limits of ourselves and find, hap happens, find happiness in something greater than ourself. This runs against the grain of modernity's atomised and self-centred egoism. <coughs> of course, this particular ideal of interpersonal union has been so deeply debased and corrupted, it's almost dead. Marriage has been used and abused as a religious um, uh, sacrament, a means to transfer property, a way to forge family alliances, a device for controlling sex and reproduction. It's treated women as property, reinforced ideas about racial purity, and been promoted as the latest hot consumer must have. <laughs> Heterosexuals have been forced into it, and homosexuals excluded from it for all the wrong reasons. In short, for centuries, Marriage has been used by elites to maintain their cultural, social and economic power. It's been a tool of social control. But it has changed. Wives are no longer the property of their husbands. Interracial marriages are no longer prohibited. I believe marriage can and should continue to change so that it reflects the needs of a contemporary society. One of these needs, as I've already said, is for examples of selfless personal union. Marriage, as I would like it to evolve, would be an institution open to everyone who wishes to make the kind of commitment it requires. This commitment would not bring any extra, any extra legal or financial rights or benefits and there would be no stigma attached to not choosing that kind of relationship and that kind of commitment, there would simply be recognition that for some people, marriage is what suits them best. Obviously, I believe that amongst those people would be LGBTs. Call me naive, but in stripping back marriage to its core meaning, I'd like to think that LGBT people might have a special role to play, if at least some of us are more sensitive to the ways in which marriage has been used in the past, abused in the past, to maintain social control. Perhaps we could help restore some dignity to the institution by modelling committed unions for their own sake. Marriage will not change LGBT people, but it's just possible we might change marriage, and for the better. 
Beck and Lee, two young lesbians from Launceston, are two of the most down-to-earth people I know. But when they emerged from the registry of births, deaths and marriages on January the 2nd, having just become Australia's first registered same-sex couple under Tasmania's new legislation allowing same-sex couples to register their relationships with the state, their eyes were brimming with tears. I'd never seen them cry before. I didn't think they could cry. <laughs> They're pretty tough. What's the matter, I said. You know, was there a problem? Is there a problem? And no, Beck said. It wasn't until we were in there that we realised this is the real thing. I never thought it would make a difference, but it does. And then she said the key words. Now it's like we really belong. Symbols matter. I learned this from the Tasmanian gay law reform debate. In the absence of gay men going to jail, the decriminalisation of gay sex was, like marriage reform, largely a symbolic issue. The long and heated debate that we had in Tasmania sparked, mobilised and then discredited a militant anti-gay right, anti rights movement while carrying with it and mainlining all the varied uh, aspirations of the LGBT community. Decriminalisation became a symbol of which direction Tasmania would take into the 21st century. And when it was resolved, Tasmania emerged from a chrysalis of hate and ignorance transformed. If you're sitting there and you're thinking, I support marriage, yeah, we should be equal, that's fine. But the odds are stacked against us. There's just no hope. Then I have a very simple response. Regardless of the indifference and opposition marriage equality faces, both within our own community and within the broader community, there is great hope for change. That hope springs from people working together for a common goal and knowing that one day they will succeed. For me, that hope even has a name. It's called Tasmania, the land where anything is possible. It's my dream that one day our hope for dignity, freedom and equality as LGBTI people will also come to be known by another great name, Australia. Thank you. If you'd like to lend your voice to the gay marriage campaign or find out more about gay activism in Australia, visit Rodney Croom's website on rodneycroom.id.au.